general topics uh, that will probably help you hopefully on your high school equivalency. Um, we did a little bit on coordinate grid yes, or last week. Um, I don't know how much of it you remember, but let's start it with there. So Ms. Kate, if you can hit the record button, we can, we can try and see how this goes. It's recording. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, Ryan, hopefully you have the packet. I think we talked a little bit about it last week, um, about the game Battleship and how that was coordinates. So the packet looks something like this, I hope. Um, if, if it doesn't have that, then it should be this. Are you all set with that? Is that okay? <laughs> I, I hope you stay awake for the whole thing there, Ms. Ryan. Um, okay, so the coordinate grid. All right, we talked about it a little bit, but let's go over it again, make sure, um, because this is a basis for algebra, for higher uh, levels of education, uh, higher levels of math, I should say, not higher education. Um, but it is going to be something that you're, if you continue on in college, you're going to have to be able to read graphs. You're going to have to be able to understand some of the formulas. So let's see what we can do for this. So it's the coordinate grid and the vocabulary. Um, we have the coordinate plane. Remember that plane is just a flat surface. All right, coordinate plane just tells you where you are on that surface. And what allows us to do that is to place a grid. And this is the grid, it just um, can be, you can designate any type of material that you need. Got that at the wrong spot. Um, there's, uh, it just sets parameters. Again, you can have these be any level that you want. You could have this be the first line be 10, 20, 30, uh, whatever works for you on that. Um, so that's going to allow us to understand how we're going to be drawing lines, graphs, um, all those types of things. So it's broken up into the x-axis, which is our perpendicular uh, to the y-axis. It's the horizontal axis. The x-axis is always going to be first, um, always going to be horizontal. When we're talking coordinates, the x coordinate is always going to be in the first term. Our y axis is going to be the vertical. And notice again on here, where these two lines intersect, it's going to be called the origin because it's a zero here for the y x axis and the y axis. Remember that your this is set up pretty much as a number line. All right, here's your first point, zero. You have one, two, three, four, five, and it goes in that direction. And then just like a number line, it goes down here in the negative direction, negative one, negative two, negative three, in this direction. Same thing for the y-axis. This is your zero, and then your number line goes vertically, going up to the positive direction, or to the negative direction. And when we designate uh, for the ordered pair, what we're looking for actually is the point where these two intersect, um, where both the X and the Y uh, lines intersect. Okay, it's not the square itself, um, that's something different, but where the ordered pair tells us where we're gonna be. Okay, and remember that the for an ordered pair, the x is always going to be your first term and y is going to be the second term. Perpendicular, the nice thing about these grids is that they are always going to be perpendicular to each other. That means it's going to be a 90 degree angle. All right, so um, it works out really, really well that way so that we can draw a straight line and allows us to do that. And again, like I was saying, the origin is where the coordinates are zero, zero. Okay, so like I was saying, X and Y, the coordinates are always expressed in parentheses and separated by a comma. The X value will always come first. OK, 
Okay, and what you do for that is locate the x value on the x axis and draw a line vertically. The y value will always come second, and you locate the y value on the y axis and draw a line horizontally. The point is found at the intersection of those two lines. All right, so if we were going to plot these points, um, what we would do is let me change this here a little bit. And all right, so first point is two. So here's two. So I'm just going to draw a line. Maybe I should make it big enough to see it. I'm going to draw a line through two vertically. Okay, that just tells us that these are all x values are all two. Now I'm going to go to five. And on the y-axis, 5 is right here. So I'm going to draw a line through there. And our value, all right, and now what we need to do is we need to label the uh, point. You can call it A, or you can put the coordinates in there, 2, 5. Either way would be OK. All right, B would be negative 3, 2. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move this X to negative 3. And now I'm going to move my Y axis to 2. Y axis to 2. Where they intersect is point B. There. C is negative 4, negative 5. One thing about this, notice that both of these coordinates are negative. That's going to tell me that it's going to be down here because this is negative terms here and negative terms here. All right. Quadrants are broken up into four different vectors. This is considered 1, this is considered 2, and notice we use Roman numerals. This is considered three, and this is considered four. And four in Roman numerals is IV. So here, both A or both the X and the Y are both going to be positive. B, the X is negative, and the Y is positive. Quadrant three, they're both going to be negative. And quadrant four, the X is positive and the Y is negative. So if you see any of these, you're going to be able to figure out pretty much where they're going to be. But let's also use our coordinates here. And we've got uh, negative four. I'm going to move negative four. And then I'm going to move to negative five. Thing. And here's our point C. Okay. Ryan, do you have any problems on, on these coordinates? Or? I think these are easy. These ones like they're really, really easy. Okay, well then I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm not gonna beat a dead horse here. If you you're you're my student today, so I, we're going to let you set the pace, okay? Uh, Miss Kate and I are probably pretty okay on coordinates. So, all right. I think I think I I understand these ones, and then I also understand where like some of the ones where like they have like the number, and then like in the corner of the number they have a number. You know what I'm talking about? Not exactly. You're talking exponents. When we get to it, I will know. So these okay. Ones are, um, these ones are easy. These are easy. All right. Um, all right. So this was the answer for all of those. But uh, that's easy. All right. So are you okay on naming the points then? Yeah. You're okay. All right. So like A was five eight. Hopefully. Yes, I got it right. Okay. 
so you're okay on this type of stuff. B is negative three. Negative four and positive three. Negative four positive three. Man. Okay. So one thing I'm going to ask you, what's E? E is zero, zero. Zero, zero. Also, the origin. All right. Nailed that one. Okay. Moving on. Do you like doing shapes? Yeah, with like with these grids, I like doing shapes with them. I think they're pretty cool. You can okay. use them up there. Well, tell you what, why don't you try a couple of them? I like I like to do them myself. I've got a four zero, and I'm gonna go to well, let me change colors here. Four zero zero zero. Then I'm going to go up to four four. Oops, that's a little back there. And then I'm going to go back down to four zero. Okay. These are always. If you see these where the first number and the last number or coordinates are the same, you know it's going to be a closed figure. Okay. Um, do you want to try a couple of these on your own or? I understand it. I get it. Get it? Okay. All right. You the boss. All right. That's what the shape should look like. All right. Usually people kind of mess this one up and they end up having something that looks like, I don't know, something like this. And yeah, so I, I, but you're okay on that. So awesome. All right. Um, you can design one yourself with your kids if you want. They're always fun. Um, here's another sheet for practicing if you'd like to do some four quadrant graphing. Um, again, you're going to be starting at uh, negative three, two, so you'd be starting right here and going up to seven, two, right, which would be here, uh, seven, negative eight, so seven, negative eight, and then I can't read these, they're too small, negative three, negative eight. So hopefully, and then, okay, so they're simple, really not hard to graph, um, but it's kind of interesting because eventually you're going to be able to look at a line. Do you remember how we found like the slopes of lines and that there's formulas for finding those lines? Okay, all right. Um, so that's one of the things that we're going to be working towards eventually. So these are all just different ones that you could practice if you want. I'm not going to ask you to do them. Um, it's fun, but um, other than that, all right. So we just covered this entire thing in 20 minutes. Nice job. Okay. All right. So let me just cross this off. And the other one I really wanted to work on today was exponents. How familiar are you That's with exponents? That's the ones I was talking about. The okay, cool. All right. Exponents. You have this packet? I don't think we got them because we didn't get nothing. We haven't got nothing in like two weeks on Tuesday when we go down to get our stuff. Um, well, you should have gotten some not this week. Last week, I told her that we were going to. Uh, so they might be in that brown envelope. That's what I just checked. They're not in it. I got fractions. No, I Actually, that one I just paper clipped together. 
I hope they remember to give it to you. I got science and then. I got I got measurements and then I got fractions and then I got two step equations. Hmm. Okay. Well, um, that's going to make it a little bit harder. So, um, what I can do, let's just go through a little bit of it. Uh, because, well, you said, it, so you knew that. This was the thing that we're going to be working on today with exponents. So let's go through that. You remember that exponents are just a fast way to multiply, or a different way to multiply. So the things that you need to know. Um, okay, I'm going to move this over here. Um, here we go. All right, so the base is your big number. That's the number or variable that is going to be multiplied. Okay, so the exponent is this number, the three, and that just tells you how many times this two is going to be multiplied. So what you would have, if you read this together, it would be two to the third power, which would be two times two times two. Two times four times two is eight. So this is actually going to equal eight. This is a different way of writing it. Okay? So this whole thing together is called the power. That's an expression with a base and an exponent. You can have things like um, x to the fourth power. Okay? Um, it can be a number. It can be variables. If you end up with an uh, like an x as your exponent, like 2 to the x, then we're going to get into some logarithms. And we really don't want to get into the logarithms right now. So those are some of the basic vocabulary. All right, so if you found, you had 3 to the 5th. All right, then we have 3 to the 5th. All right, the base is going to be your three, your three. Okay, so that's the number that is multiplied, and exponent is five. That tells you how many times three is going to be multiplied. So if you did it out in longhand, you'd have three times three times three times three times three. Okay, and if you multiply those all together, you'll get 243. I think I did that right. I hope I did that right. Um, so the nice thing is you can do this. Or do you have a calculator there with you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know how to input that into a calculator? You know, this is this is really time consuming if you do it that three times three times three times three times three. Find it okay. So what you would do is you would put your base in first. Yeah, it's um 243. Okay. Oh, I did it right. Okay, cool. So using the calculators will really, um, if you start doing things like that, that'll be on the part of the test that you will use your calculator for. So they don't expect you to have to do all of this stuff by hand unless it's really simple. Um, but that would be that for there. Okay. So base to the first power. So if we think about it, three to the third is three times three times three, okay? Which is 927. Three squared, or three to the second power, is just three times three. Therefore, three to the first, all right, is just gonna be three. So anything raised to the first power is itself. Always, okay? 
if b to the first power is going to be d. Cabillion to the first power is going to be a cabillion. Okay, so now what we need to do is we need to think a little bit more about anything to the zero power. All right, so if we have five to the zero power, the base is five and the exponent is zero. Okay. I thought I put that in there. All right, so five to the zero power. All right, any number or variable raised to the zero power is one. It's just a rule of math. Okay, so negative 279 raised to the zero power is going to be one. A cabillion raised to the zero power is going to be one. Doesn't matter. Anything to the zero power is one. B to the zero power or X to the zero power is going to be one. All right. One of the things I'm going to suggest is um, when I get that, I'll resend those packets. Um, for next week, um, but understanding what perfect squares are is going to help you a lot. That's for your math, um, math facts. All right, so you should know at least this much. So one squared would be the same thing as one times one, which is one. Two squared is four. Three squared is three times three, which is nine. And you can go right down here. And these are ones that you can memorize and it'll help you a great deal. All right. Um, I like this one, eight squared. You know what that one is, right? You know our special term for eight squared, eight times eight. I ate and I ate till I got sick on the floor. Eight times eight is 64. You remember that one? I think you made some comments about that in class previously. Um, so again, those are ones that are important for you. These are ones, if you knew up to, say, like 13 squared, that would be nice. These other ones, use, uh, use paper and pencil, and you can figure them out. Okay? So these are perfect squares. So we're squaring the numbers here and getting this term. So now if we look at square roots, and that's the opposite. Squaring is where we're going to be multiplying, all right? Square roots is we're going to find numbers that we need to, like for square root of four, what two numbers when they're multiplied by, or by the, what number by itself when it's uh, squared will give you four, and that's going to be two, okay? What number um, when square root of nine is going to be three, all right? So three times three is nine. That'll get us back into this direction. Okay, eight times over here, eight times eight is 64. Okay, so the square root of 64 is going to be eight. We're just looking for the number that when multiplied by itself will give you that perfect square, square root, I should say. Okay, and I definitely will get these packets over to you. Um, all right, um, so now, you remember PEMDAS. PEMDAS is our friend uh, sometimes. Um, so we've got, um, when you have an equation like this, you remember we're going to do parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. Okay, so here we've got a parentheses. So our only parentheses is right here. So I like to underline what I'm what I'm applying. All right, so eight times five is the first thing I'm going to bring that down. Then I'm going to bring everything else straight down. Don't forget that you have more stuff. Okay, so exponents. All right, we've got two squared. All right, so I'm going to do that one next. And that's going to be four. All right, so I've got uh, 45 minus 12 plus four plus 40. Next time we're going to do multiplication division. We don't have any of that. So now we're going to do addition and subtraction. Remember that we always do left to right when we have just addition and subtraction. So what I'm going to do is 45 minus 12 is 33. And then I'm going to add. Now it's all addition, so all I have to do is keep adding it together. But the big thing is make sure you bring down everything that you don't compute. All right. Um, 
if you forget anything, it's going to throw your answer way, way off. Okay. Um, one of the things I wanted to make sure you understood is that if you have Mr. practices, Jim. I'm sorry. Mr. Jim, when we get the packets, would you be able to work on that a little bit more with me? Because I, this is like the area I don't understand is like when you multiply. Okay. All right. Um, I'd be more than happy to do that. Um, it also is on Google. I put this up on Google Classroom already. Um, but um, yes, I'd be more than happy to do that. I truly would. Um, because it's hard for you right now not to have the packet in front of you, I'm assuming. Is that right? Would it be easier for you if you did have the packet so you could write notes? Yeah, it would have definitely been easier if I had a packet. Because this is the this is why I don't understand. Like when I get to them, I don't understand this. Okay. All right. Um, do you want to just go over a couple just so you have an idea, or would you rather we move on? No, we we can go over a few. Okay. All right. So remember that we've got um, parentheses. All right. Pendant parenthesis parentheses first, so we're going to do 1 plus 2 plus 3. That's all in the parentheses. So what that would be is 6 squared. Okay, so you remember 6 squared is just 6 times 6. So our answer would be 36. So all this, parent, this exponent applies to everything inside that parentheses. Okay? So here, over here, we've got our parenthesis, which we do first. So 6 minus 1 is going to be 5. All right. Now what we need to do is we need to do the next step. There's multiplication. Oh, but we do have an exponent. 8 to the 0 is going to be 1. So we've got 9 times 1 plus 5. Next step is going to be multiplication, 9 times 1. So we'll have 9 plus 5, and that'll give us 14. Did I do something that messes up your mind here? Okay. All right. So because these exponents are inside of the parenthesis, that means we're going to do the inside of the parenthesis first. So 2 to the third power means 2 times 2 times 2, which is 8. And 3 to the third power, 3 times 3 times 3, which is uh, 27. So 8 plus 27 is 35. So 35 divided by 7 is just 5. All right, so this division, so again, I'm sorry, you're going to do everything inside here, and then you're going to do the division after that, so parenthesis and then your other operations. Okay, let me take a look at something here for a second. Okay. Um, and again, this is, we'll go over this when you have the packet. But I did also want to show you that we can also do this with variables. Variables are the letters, all right? X times X will be X squared. A times A times A, A to the third power. Here's where it's gonna get a little bit more confusing, okay? Where 3Z times 3Z, so all I did, remember multiplication, um, it doesn't matter the order, so all I did is I rearranged this because 3 times Z times 3 times Z, I just rearranged this. So 3 times 3 times Z times Z. All right, well, that would be 3 squared times Z squared. And I would just rewrite it this way. And 3 squared is just 9, so 9Z squared. You liked algebra, if I remember correctly. Is that true? Yeah, okay. So do you remember these from algebra? 
Yeah. Yeah. All right. You've got a very good memory, right? You, uh, you're very, very. Not sure what the right word is, but uh, you do a lot of different things. So, all right, let me move on here. Okay, one thing I want to make sure you understand, and again, we'll go over this again, because this exponent is on the outside of the parenthesis. What that means is you're going to do inside the parenthesis first. So three plus two is five, five squared, okay, which is 25. Three squared plus two squared, the exponents are just going to apply to those numbers. So three squared is nine, two squared is four. When we add those together, 13, 13 definitely does not equal 25. Okay. Um, you're gonna see some things like this on the test where it says evaluate f of x when it equals two x squared. You know, when you see this f of x, all it means is every time you see an x, Put in what the, whatever they give you. So this would be the same thing as two times x squared. Okay. Well, x squared is nine, so two times nine is eighteen. So f of x is eighteen. All right. Um, okay. with you. Negative exponents. You remember those? No? Okay. I remember those. You don't you do remember those? Okay. All you have to do for a negative exponent to change it from a negative to a positive is that negative just tells you to flip it. Find the reciprocal. Alright like three to the negative three is the same thing as one over three cubed. Alright? So we've got five to the negative two, so that all we would do is take that five and put it as a denominator, and it'll be one over five squared. Because you remember that this is the same thing, that one, okay? These are all over one. Do they always go over one? If it's a whole number, yes. Um, two to the negative five. All right, so I'm going to flip it. Okay, but that negative five goes with the two, but by flipping it, it got rid of this negative and it becomes one to two, one over two to the fifth. Okay, which is two to the fifth is 32. If you input that into your calculator, it will also do it as a either decimal or a fraction, but you can go back and forth between those. All right, so four over one to the negative third, change it, flip it, one over four to the third, which is one over 64. All right, here you've got, and this is, gets a little confusing, you've got negative five to the negative two. Okay, so let's remember this is over one. So I'm going to change it. The negative here does not change. All right, so it's going to be one over negative five squared. So this would be negative five times negative five. And you remember negative times a negative is always going to be a positive. So that would be one over 25. Negative three to the negative third, flip it, that negative over here, the negative integer does not change, but now you just do negative three times negative three times negative three. You do realize with the exponent, if you have a negative number and it's to an odd number, your answer is gonna stay odd. Because for squared, it's a negative times a negative. For a, uh, so the third power is going to be negative times a negative times a negative, which is going to keep it as negative. So anytime it's this uh, exponent's an odd number with a uh, negative sign, a 
okay? You have to realize what if it's a even, it's going to be positive. If it's odd, it's going to be negative. Okay, one other thing I wanted to show you, these are both negatives. All right, so to do that, all I'm going to do is this goes to the bottom and this goes to the top. So that would be 4 squared over 8 squared. Okay. So you just like, so pretty much you're just swapping it. So you put the one at the top, I mean at the bottom, and then you just swap the number to make it a po uh, positive? Absolutely. Yep, this one is, is ne never going to change. Um, okay. The only thing that was different here, okay, instead of the one, I brought this up. And I brought this, change colors here, I brought different colors. I brought this to the bottom. So this just tells you that you're going to invert it, whatever term it's applied to. Okay, that's the one tricky part about it. Because when we get into some higher levels of algebra, there's going to be where you're going to have to move things around a little bit more. Then, um, oops, I'm sorry. All right. Um, it, it's just going to be a little bit more complicated, but we'll get there. All right. All right. So you have one half the negative three. So what we're going to do is make it flip it two over one to the positive three. And two over one is the same thing as just two, so two to the third power is eight. All right, so these are all going to be the same that way. One over four to the negative two. Remember that exponent is applying to everything inside the parenthesis. So that's going to be four over one squared, okay, which would be 16, because four squared is 16, one squared is one. One times one is one. All right, here it gets a little trickier because we've got two thirds. All right, so what we're going to do is we're definitely going to just flip it to get rid of this negative. All right, so now we have three over two to the fourth power. Remember again, this four applies to everything inside here. So that's going to be the same thing as three to the fourth divided by two to the fourth. So that would be 81 over 16. Okay, this applies to everything inside. To get rid of the negative, just flip it. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad you made it today. You really do make my day, Ms. Mariah. All right. Um, so again, these are all going to be similar. We'll go over them more uh, when you get your packet. Um, I really don't mind ever repeating things for you. So uh, in fact, if you really get the hang of it and we have other people next time, you can teach it. I'll definitely favor that. So some rules of, of exponents. The base, again, is the number that is multiplied. So base. All right, so your base is the number that is multiplied, which is three. The exponent is how many times it's multiplied. Another rule is anything to the first power is itself. So three to the one is just going to be three. Anything to the zero power. So um, k to the zero power is going to be one. It doesn't matter whether it's a algebra or algebraic symbol or number, constant, whatever, it's always going to be one. And anything to the negative exponent is the reciprocal. Okay, um, you'll get a worksheet that you can do some practice on. Um, and then um, we've got some exponent properties which we'll go over um, 
when you have your packet because I want you to be able to put notes on there. Okay. All right. Let me make a note here so I'm back. So I remember to send it next time. Okay. Um, we're really fine here. So let me just give you one quick. Um, uh, I just want to do. There it is. Okay. Um, I just want to show you like a, a, a five minute thing. I want to talk about ecosystem. We're switching over to science here. Um, an ecosystem is everything around you. Okay, right now your ecosystem is your apartment and everything in the apartment. Okay, including the kids, uh, fans, whatever. All right, so what I want to do is I want to um, start this. I think I've got the sequence down here. Okay. And And I'm going to start it again and see if I can. There we go. And share screen. Okay. All right. So this is kind of, a, I think your kids might like this also. Um, let's make this full size. This is only about five minutes long. Meet the pygmy hippo. They live in Africa and they are too stinking cute. Like this little one. Oh my God, look how adorable he is. Too bad these guys are dying out. Yep, they're in danger. There's only about two or 3,000 of them left in the wild. Mainly because, you guessed it, as usual, humans are screwing something up. We're clear cutting and logging their habitat. If they all die, the species will be gone forever. In a word, extinct. The pygmy hippo story isn't unique. There are lots of endangered species that environmentalists have been urging, imploring, just begging us to protect for years. They use all kinds of different tactics. They pull on our heartstrings and show us how cute and sad these little animals are. They appeal to our fears. Stop clear cutting rainforests. One of those plants might cure cancer. And they tap into our selfish side. Like, if you don't save the coral reefs, you'll never be able to see these majestic places in person and take the perfect selfie. But despite all this, species go extinct all the time. Check out this giant list of extinct species, like the Caribbean monk seal, the Yangtze river dolphin, and the St. Helena earwig. So why should we care if a species goes extinct? I mean, does anyone really miss the St. Helena earwig? Wait, what is it? what's an earwig, Lauren? Oh, that? Okay, so throughout Earth's history, scientists know of five mass extinctions. This is when a ton of life on Earth got wiped out. The most recent happened about 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs all died off. But scientists are estimating we're in the middle of the sixth mass extinction right now, where species are dying out at crazy high rates. Some estimates range from 1,000 to 10,000 times higher than normal. And for the most part, we humans are to blame. We humans tend to destroy nature so we can live with all our luxurious modern conveniences like electricity, indoor skydiving, food trucks, and airplanes. I mean, pretty much anything and everything awesome. And saving endangered species can be a huge pain and super expensive. It can mean big sacrifices on our part, like, you know, not building that awesome indoor skydiving building where these wetlands are. And it can be especially hard in developing countries. I mean, how do you tell people whose very livelihood depend on poaching or hunting endangered species to stop? Like in areas in Mexico where jobs are hard to come by, so people end up selling endangered sea turtle eggs, even at the risk of getting caught and spending nine years in prison. In a lot of places, this could be a life or death choice. So is trying to save these endangered species really worth it? Well, there are, of course, moral and ethical arguments to save species, like all life has a right to be here or that we owe it to our grandchildren to preserve species so that they can also see them in the wild. And let's be honest, when it comes to saving species, some of us are more inclined to care about the oh so cute and adorable ones, like these panda bears or these sand kittens, and it may be harder to get on board saving this weird looking salamander called an ohm. Ew. I mean, I, I'm not against saving it, but it is ugly. But more reasons aside, there are practical reasons we should care. Our very survival could depend on it. 
You see, living things in an ecosystem depend on each other, and the disappearance of one species can have big impacts on the whole thing. A lot like how a Jenga tower depends on each block and becomes more unstable as pieces are removed and rearranged. Take the cute cuddly sea otter. They live in kelp forests and oceans and eat sea urchins. In the early 1900s, they were hunted almost to extinction because they made luxurious and fashionable fur coats. That is before wearing a fur became like a social taboo. And when the sea otter populations dropped, the sea urchin population surged, eating up all the kelp and destroying the kelp forest. And if you're thinking, so what? I've never even heard of a kelp forest. First of all, Kelp forests are these crazy cool underwater forests made of these like giant seaweed type structures. And secondly, they're crucial to the overall health of the ocean. And we benefit a lot from them. They provide habitat, food, and breeding grounds for a lot of marine life, including some tasty seafoods you might like, like lobster, crab, and rockfish. We're, we're getting some need after this, right? For sure. Kelp forests can also protect coastal areas from flooding due to storm surges, and they make for some pretty cool scuba and snorkeling spots. Not to mention kelp is in a lot of beauty products like shampoo. The list goes on. So right about now, you should be starting to feel sad about the sea urchins destroying this cool habitat. But don't worry, this story has a happy ending. Sea otter hunting was outlawed, and so now the sea otter population is back on the rise, though some populations are still endangered. And kelp forests are just one example of an ecosystem. There's forests, grasslands, deserts, you get what I'm talking about. And each one of these ecosystems helps us out by providing unique benefits like food, water, and natural resources. These benefits are collectively known as ecosystem services. Think of ecosystem services as pretty much the opposite of your internet company's customer service. Ecosystems actually help you out while internet companies will put you on hold for days. Did y'all just hang up on me? But back to ecosystems. They are healthiest when there are lots of different kinds of species in them. So when we start to kill off a species, that ecosystem starts to get shaky. Kind of like that Jenga tower. <laughs> And it's sometimes it's hard to predict how the loss of one species will impact an ecosystem until it's gone. And then, it may be too late. So given all this, we're curious. How much are you willing to sacrifice to preserve a species? Take for example the Amazon rainforest where white-cheeked spider monkeys are endangered because of clear cutting for cattle pastures. Like, would you give up that burger whose meat came from that region? So how do you decide how far you're willing to go to help out that endangered species? Let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching guys. Oh. Before I leave, if you like this video, be sure to check out this totally unrelated video of ours about how teen blood can be the next anti-aging fad. Speaking of cute, weird animals, have y'all heard of Deep Look? Check out their channel. They've got a bunch of awesome close-ups of animals doing crazy things. I mean, it'll creep you I, out. Some you know, make me like, okay. in a cool, good way, I guess. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching, guys. Okay, so basically what I wanted to do is I wanted to show you um, <laughs> uh, this case hungry. Okay, lobster is, is my friend. Um, Mariah, are you going to cook lobster in your culinary class? I would not. If, if we make lobster in culinary class, I'm not showing up that day. Oh, oh, yes, you, you got to cook us lobster. I'll be over. <laughs> I don't like seafood. I don't like the smell of it either. <laughs> Oh, okay. It's one of my favorites, but um, that's okay. We can find you something else. Um, all you have to see the great cooks don't always eat what they what they make. Sometimes um, they just make it for other people. Like my wife makes vegetables. She doesn't eat vegetables. My whole vegetables. house don't eat seafood. You what? Oh, the house. The house don't eat seafood. <laughs> okay, I guess that's 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 fair. All righty. <laughs> well, this conversation is just going downhill quickly. All right, so um, that's what. Did you do you have the packet for the ecosystem, or did you not get that either? No. Man, oh man, I feel like I made them and not getting them. Okay. Um, so let me just do a real quick, um, real quick, uh, okay, this is what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about. And the main point that I want to um, show you 
is that the sun is the origin of all energy on the earth. Okay, the sun gives energy to grass, trees, whatever, um, and it takes its its um, that energy and gives it to herbivores, things that eat the grass. Okay, um, and then whatever eats the the grasshopper, okay, it is called an omnivore. That means it will eat either grass or insects. Um, carnivore means that it is going to, uh, it only eats animals, okay, carnivore. And then there are carnivores that eat smaller carnivores. And then the carnivores die, okay, and they go into the decomposer portion. Okay, because death, you, your body just ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Have you ever heard that term? So it, the body decomposes, make nutrients, and the nutrients go back into the producer. So that energy that came from the sun is going to do a full chain, a full circle. So that's one of the things that you have to understand about a food chain. What they were showing you on the video uh, was a food web. And we'll go into that a little bit more heavily when we have some other people. And you also have a packet to look at. All right. Um, let's see. There's one other thing I did want to show you. There it is. Um, just because I do like polar bears, I want to show you this. It's about climate change. All right. Um, so what I need to do is stop share and then start share. Yeah, we don't want to take any very much. Okay. This is a simple explanation of climate change based on an article in the New York Times. The average temperature on the surface of the planet has already increased 1.7 degrees Fahrenheit since 1880, which may not seem like much, but think about it this way. The heat from human emissions is roughly equal to 400,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs exploding across the planet every single day. Future generations are in big trouble. But for now, it'll gradually continue to get warmer and storms will grow more intense, with longer periods of drought in between. But longer term, if emissions continue to rise unchecked, the climate disasters will be so severe they will destabilize entire nations, send millions of refugees across borders, cause widespread extinction of most species on Earth, and melt the polar ice caps, leaving most of the world's coastal cities several feet underwater. All this could take centuries, but something like the sudden collapse of agriculture would trigger immediate chaos in society. Best case is we get our act together and begin to rapidly bring emission levels down. Meanwhile, Earth turns out to be less sensitive to greenhouse gases than we currently believe, plants and animals adapt quickly, and major technological breakthroughs help society limit emissions and adjust to climate change. But these are all the opposite of what we're actually seeing, so the only thing in our control is to limit emissions using all available tools and best behaviors currently at our disposal. Worst case, the collapse of food production causes spiraling prices, and as our capitalist utopia breaks down, billions starve as our world gets violent and messy real quick. Kind of like a zombie apocalypse, but with extreme hunger spreading chaos instead, so yeah, still just like a zombie apocalypse. This would be coupled with the melting of the Antarctic ice sheet, leading to rapidly rising seas that would force us to abandon many of our greatest cities and all of the social and scientific progress that we were making within them. Adding insult to injury is the fact that many of the emissions were emitted while building these now abandoned underwater metropolises. If emissions continue unchecked, we're looking at a total rise of between 80 to 160 feet, which would occur if all the ice in the poles melted. So the oceans will rise. The real question is how fast? Scientists only have Earth's history to base their predictions on, which suggests that the rate has occasionally hit one foot per decade, so we'll have to adapt to an altered coastline sooner or later, 
but probably much sooner than later because computer forecasts only give us a range of future possibilities. The most important evidence comes from the study of past climate conditions, which clearly show that every time the amount of carbon dioxide in the air rises, the earth warms up, ice melts, and the ocean rises. What's important to remember here is that we are in uncharted territory. Humans are pumping carbon dioxide into the air far faster than nature ever has before us. Scientists have been publishing strong evidence that warming is making drought and heat waves more frequent, causing heavier rainstorms and more severe coastal flooding. But while the internet has made us all more aware of weather disasters in distant countries, it's hard to prove these are all directly made worse by climate change. Canada and Russia both have vast frozen lands and could see some economic benefits from a warmer climate. Putin and the Russians, and until recently Canada as well, have been reluctant to make ambitious climate commitments, but expect that to change as these countries realize they will be swamped by millions of refugees from less fortunate nations. Libertarians and other political conservatives do not like the policies proposed to fight climate change, and have chosen to try and block them by actively undermining the science. This effort has been funded by the oil and coal industry, who favor making money above all else. As more resources are devoted to solving the problem, our chances at big technological breakthroughs are improving, but we still should be spending about three times as much money as we currently are on these efforts, according to several in-depth reports. You can reduce your carbon footprint by doing things like plugging leaks in your home insulation, installing a smart thermostat, taking public transit, taking less airplane trips, buying an electric car, and putting solar panels on your roof. A big one is eating less meat, but what's really needed is for you to speak up and exercise your rights as a citizen, because strong collective action through state and national policies is how we'll make the most impact. Considering that we've been ignoring scientists' warnings since the 80s to limit emissions, we're pretty late in the game. But we've finally reached a moment where nearly every country in the world agrees this is a huge problem and seem ready to commit to taking at least some kind of action. Leading corporations will continue to make bold promises to do their part, low emission technologies will improve, and many states and cities will go much further than any goals set by their national governments. The United States, the world's biggest economy, is finally starting to move aggressively, and China, the world's largest emitter, is beginning to recognize that it needs to do the same, as many of its megacities will be underwater if the seas rise too high. But it's up to us the ordinary citizens, to continue demanding our political leaders tackle climate change, the hardest problem that humanity has ever faced. So like and share this video to help it spread. A special thanks to Justin Gillis of the New York Times for putting together the original article, which is linked in the more info section below. Until next time, thanks for watching TDC, I'm Bryce Plank. A chance to take legal action. And we'll try again. Here we are. Okay. All right. Um, so one of the things is uh, the current political attitude is that climate change is not happening. Um, you hear from some of our lead politicians, um, but the scientists are all saying otherwise. And I think um, I think one of the things that our people are having some issues with is the fact that they're getting confused with climate change versus the weather. If you have a week of um, like this week of hot weather, that does not necessarily uh, classify as climate change. Climate change is something that lasts for a long, long time. Uh, I, let me uh, so climate change is a persistent, noticeable change in local or global weather patterns over a long period of time. So that's something that it's not just the weather. It's not just a couple rainy days. It's something that's going to be happening for over years over a long, long period. So that's one of the differences, and I think that's what some of our government leaders do not understand. Uh, one thing on the video, it said how the U.S. and China has agreed 
to uh, limit emissions, well, that has gone out the window. It's not true anymore. Uh, the U.S. has pulled out of the uh, climate agreement um, because they thought it was economically not to their to certain industries advantage. So um, that's one thing that people are kind of upset about. So um, again, without the packet, it's going to be really hard for you to uh, take notes. Um, so what I'm going to do, uh, it's about 5 of 12 right now. So what I'm going to do is tell you to have an early lunch. I'm not sure if you're scheduled for anything after this. Um, but I hope you have a good weekend. And we will talk to you next week. If you have any questions on any of this stuff or you want some more material for uh, exponents, if you go to the classroom, um, it'll be there. It's on there under that. Okay? All right. All right. Thank you. Okay. We'll see you later.